thanks everyone. It's uh, really interesting to get the opportunity to come and talk about innovation. Our company is uh, built on innovation and, and disru disruption and doing things differently. So I thought what I'd do is take you through a short history of who we are, where we came from, and how we built the mindset to get to um, this opportunity with, with wool and surfboards. Uh, I guess going back, when we look back at the 50s, the world population was going through the roof. Uh, the world wars had finished, we'd seen uh, an established wool auction model that was proving successful, wool was at record high prices, um, fashion was, was really emerging, um, consumption was really, were driving wool sales and purchases. And as growers, we thought, you beauty, we're going to be rich. It's going to be great. But unfortunately, um, what we saw was uh, the rise of synthetic products, um, petroleum-based products, and new innovations that came from synthetic materials. And what we found was, uh, and what we saw was that synthetic-based companies were more open to innovation were able to create products that responded to consumer change uh, and gave people more materials that they wanted. And rapidly, we, re we found that the wool industry struggled. I think uh, we, we became what looked like a sunset industry. In 1990, we had 70 million sheep. I think now we're looking between 27 and 29 million sheep. Uh, so we've really struggled to, to capture that value. And when we looked at that model, um, and some of the challenges we've faced. It's a really adverse adversarial model. Uh, no one in the supply chain really talks to each other. You know the next person in the chain, but not who the customer was. And it was this, in this environment that uh, our merino growers were really struggling uh, and really uh, thought, we need to make a change. We need to do something different. Um, as I said, we, we knew only the next person in the chain and it was almost impossible to get feedback from customers due to that distance we had. So in the, in the early days, our merino growers said, look, let's do something different. Let's try and get some of that, that money back and try and build a company which gets closer, closer to customers. Uh, and I think that was our first innovative approach. Let's really double down on, on what, we, what we are passionate about, which is our fiber, and try and create a story and a relationship with customers. And of course, that wasn't easy. This is a full page, page, a full page advertisement that went in every newspaper around the country essentially saying, don't trust the New Zealand Merino Company. And if you sell your wool to the New Zealand Merino Company, we're not going to process it through our auctions. So we really had to start thinking outside the box right from the start. So we thought, if this model isn't going to work for us, how do we shift from being price takers, from the simple, combative, short-sighted model uh, where people are really scrapping for cents? You know, five cents loses you a deal. You beat each other up on the supply chain to get the lowest price and then send it off to someone who we don't really know. How do we shift to something that's more uh, sophisticated, more complex, certainly, and definitely more resource intensive? How do we become a market shaping organization and try and drive value um, for our partners and then through to our growers? So we try to evolve our thinking to becoming more of a supply chain steward rather than just existing or coexisting with the next person in the chain, understand first and foremost what our customers want, and then work through the supply chain to deliver trust and transparency, and then capture value and pass it on to our growers. But at its core, that required us to get a really deep understanding of the end user, the customer. So for us, the customer wasn't, um, for example, the spinner or the top maker, necessarily the carpet manufacturer, it's the people using our products. And it's only through us understanding them as deeply as possible, that we can start to create value. We can start to deliver products that are gonna uh, not just impact their lives, but change their lives. Deliver them an amazing experience, which is gonna stop them thinking about the cost or the price, but think about the benefits it's gonna add to their lives to give them a better experience. And then it's our role as a company, not to rely on others to do that, but to help them deliver a customer experience or share some of those intangibles um, that makes us as growers in New Zealand so special. How can we share our story and capture the value from that? 
So in Marino, we started to segment the market. And in the early days, we looked at the, the technology that had been around. And circular net technology was um, quite established, but hadn't really been used in fine wool. And the company uh, started to kick off, which was started by a grower in the Marlborough Sounds, which became known as Icebreaker. And they found that when you shifted Merino from traditional suiting, um, high fashion products into using the circular te te uh, knit technology and next to skin garment, it was soft, it was luxurious, but it was also functional. It was great to get out in the mountains, whether it was mustering, mustering the sheeps, running through the peaks, going down the rivers and running along the riverbeds. It had amazing performance. And a young man came down to the property, Jeremy Moon, uh, and learned about this product. He actually arrived. He was following a backpacker coming around New Zealand, so he, he, he had his eye on her, and he thought, oh, let's go down to the Marlborough Sounds. It's a beautiful location. Maybe I can just see how it goes. Uh, well, he learned about this technology, and the lady left, but Jeremy left with his, these first prototypes of these garments, and from there, uh, Icebreaker was born. And Icebreaker kicked off as a Nexus skin garment, a product that was soft, um, delivered comfortable experiences, and it was really, uh, really loved by those early adopters. But what we found is our distance to market uh, made it tough for us to tell everyone about it. So we had to try and help people understand why Merino was different. So we started getting into the, the rational side of the argument. This is a cut down shot of the different types of fibers uh, that are available out there, um, a synthetic apex fiber, a synthetic conjugate fiber, and a wool fiber on the right here. Um, what we found is wool is really the most technical fiber in the world. It's an amazing fiber, not just merino, but coarse wool. And it's made up from a whole bunch of varieties of different components that deliver different experiences. So we found out what those experiences were, but we had to train people, we had to teach people, we had to educate them. And as a wool company, that's where we started to invest our time. How can we try and tell a story? How can we create, turn the science into something that was more meaningful, that helped uh, customers understand what Marina could deliver? Over the 30 minutes of exercise, there was definitely a difference between the two garments. Uh, the blue side definitely was warmer uh, and wetter throughout, and whereas on the green side, it's certainly more comfortable uh, throughout the 30 minutes of exercise. So probably about 12 years old, that video it probably hasn't aged that well. But uh, that was part of the level of education we had to provide uh, as a wool organisation to support our brand partners, to help them tell a story. And not just their brand partners tell a story, but their sales staff and the re then their retail sales staff. And it had to be simple and it had to help. And that was reasonably successful. Icebreaker continued to grow. Uh, they shifted from 50 bales to 500 bales to... 50 tons to 500 tons, and it was all looking pretty good. They started to expand into uh, a layering is another segment they started to build. So not only was Merino fantastic next to the skin, but you could layer it and get a better experience, keep your warmth, keep your dryness. And that started to progress really well. And we thought it was all going fantastically. Then we had another shift. 
uh, some of you are familiar with Peter, and some of you are familiar with the process of musing. Hands up, who's heard of musing? I'm hoping that every single person in this room kills that one. Awesome. Uh, major issue for us in the merino industry, um, and still remains a controversial um, process today. Peter, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, uh, came out and really targeted us all, as they're known to do. And our brand partners at the time came to us and said, well, what's happening uh, with musing? How important is it to you? Is there any way we can really deal with this? And from there, that was really where the start of our ZQ brand was built. Uh, we sat down with our growers, not unlike a room like this, um, and then smaller groups around the South Island and said, well, uh, with Icebreaker and with their other brand partners, they came to New Zealand, we sat down and we said, well, uh, how might we, how might we shift away from musing? What would it take on farm? What is the cost? What is the impact? What do you need to encourage you to make that shift? And our growers sat down and unpacked it and identified some ways to do so. Uh, but they said, look, this is going to be, this is going to have a productivity, productivity impact. And it's tough. I mean, we know farming isn't, isn't, isn't an easy game and we do it because we love it. Um, but this is going to make it even harder. So our partners, because of our partnership at the table, said, well, what is it going to cost? Is it $2? Is it $3? Is it $4? And we worked out what it was, and they said, yes, okay, if we're going to do this, if you're going to stop using this practice, we will commit to paying you a premium above the market, two, three dollars above the market to cover those costs. But in return, we need, um, we need that support, that substance, that supply confidence that we're going to grow together. And that was where our start of our contracts were born. Uh, last year, that's evolved to a 10-year forward contract we provide with Icebreaker, which is offer real values to our growers, but it doesn't just offer a value, it offers a connection, uh, a relationship, a partnership, and it offers confidence uh, for their farming systems. It enables them to predict the future with what they're doing with that wool check coming forward. And for us as a business, it helped us realize that it's not just the rational argument that we have to look at, the IQ part of the grain. We need to look at the EQ, the emotional side of the brain when talking to not just our growers, but our customers and our brand partners about what we need to develop. And for us, it was a really important part of the foundations of our ZQ brand, was bringing the best growers in the world uh, together with our customers and our brand partners. Because without that synergy, without sitting at the same table, we don't have the opportunity to have those discussions and talk about the real value we need to try and create for our partners and for yourselves. And that meant now we've got an even deeper story to tell, a more connecting story to tell. So Icebreaker started building um, a, a concept you, would, you may have heard of. It's called the barcode. Anyone else heard the barcode for Icebreaker? The barcode was built on, if you bought an Icebreaker garment, you scanned uh, the barcode and it enabled you to trace the fiber back uh, to the properties that supplied you, which had a real impact on, on Icebreaker in terms of getting notice and in the retail environment, but also getting um, a great passion for the product, not just from growers, but from the ambassadors, the evangelists, evangelists, the people who were really believing in not just the performance of the product, but the importance of having connection, of having a real partnership and having a sustainable fiber. So that was really going well, but uh, then we started to see more challenges come up. And our ZQ brand, which was built on this, this practice of looking after animal welfare, we started to see more, more pressure coming on from the likes of Greenpeace. Greenpeace. This is Greenpeace's annual budget. They have around $662 million a year to invest. The Nature Conservancy, $440 million. WWF, World Wildlife Fund, $300 million. And Peter, $30 million. These activist agencies, their stock and trade is headlines. That's a significant budget they've got to try and focus on creating controversy um, attacking people and generating headlines which increase, increases their fundings. If you ever read one of their business plans, it's just like any commercial business plan out there. So that means there's a significant amount of focus um, that's not just on us, um, but attacking consumers. Patagonia two years ago had a, 
a slight issue uh, with some of their wool supply from, from Uruguay. Uh, Peter went on their farm and exposed some practices. And within uh, six hours, there was 100,000 views on YouTube. Within 24, uh, 48 hours, Patagonia stopped buying wool from that, that side of the business. So for us, it really reinforced that we need to be responsive um, to our partners, but ensure that we keep doing the best, keep driving the best, uh, and keep being responsive to our, to our partners. That video was uh, from Greenpeace. Uh, it came out after the, the first Lego movie came out. It was a hugely unexpected success uh, for Lego. Um, and children and, and parents all over the world went to see it. Greenpeace came out with this video and it wasn't really targeting Lego, it was targeting Shell, who were drilling into the Antarctic, as you can pick up. And when this video dropped, Lego came out and said, well, we understand your concerns, but we've been partnering with Shell for 70 years. We, uh, we trust them, we know what they're doing, and we believe in what they're doing. Uh, two million views, two weeks on, uh, Shell said, uh, sorry, Lego said, yes, we are gonna stick, we're sticking with Shell, we're sticking with it. Three months, uh, multiple million views, people stopping buying their products. Shell came out and said, we're stopping our partnership with Lego, uh, sorry, Lego, see, we're stopping our partnership with Shell. And we're also going to invest $15 million in other uh, natural solutions for alternatives to plastic. Because what we're starting to see now is people are recognizing the next step isn't just animal welfare, it's about the environment, how we're impacting on the earth and what we're doing. While in this case, oil. Uh, exploration is, is causing the controversy. We know that microplastics are having a huge impact on the earth. In 2040, there's going to be as much plastic as fish in the ocean. Uh, just yesterday, I saw an article about uh, the trench they explored 11 kilometers into the ground, and they found 11 pieces of plastic and a new species of fish, which is great. But for us, we are facing a, a, a catastrophe um, with plastic. And what we're starting to see in the market is people asking more and more questions about how they can find natural fibers to replace that. I'm getting to the surfboard. This is getting towards the surfboard, I promise. So we're seeing people looking for more products. You know, nine out of 10 bottled waters in the US have tested positive for microplastics. Seven out of 10 bottled waters in Europe have got microplastics in them. So we wonder, uh, well, we know and people around the world are starting to recognize uh, that we need to shift away from these synthetic-based products. We need to make a change. So that's why we're absolutely uh, are positive about wool and its place and opportunities coming around. But back to the order, our ZQ platform had to evolve from this ethical position on mulesing 
to taking more steps. We had to evolve to talk about our, our social responsibility, our looking after our growers through our contracts, talking about the environment, the impact that we're having on our waterways. We're fencing riparian, putting up riparian strips. We're looking after our high country. And the brands are, are wanting to see more of that because their story is more under more and more scrutiny. They're asked to identify their supply chains now, how they treat their staff. We recently started a partnership with a, a small Swedish company um, called IKEA, who came to New Zealand, <laughs> came to New Zealand looking for an ethical source of wool supply. And uh, the first time we met them, they told me to get out of here. We told you we don't want any bloody merino; it's too expensive. I said, well, fun funnily enough, we don't just do merino anymore. We do a whole bunch of strong wools and coarser wools. And once they learned about our our ZQ platform, the traceability, the transparency, and our willingness to work in different ways. Uh, well, we've started doing business with them over the last couple of years, and they use a stack load of wool, but for them, the most important part is having the traceability and the ethics that protects their brand. Oh, one final thing on IKEA. By 2030, they've committed to having 70% of their fibre supply is uh, renewable, reusable, or repurposed. They're currently at 15%. So they've got a long way to go in a very short period of time. So they're looking for any materials that can be natural, uh, that can be repurposed. Uh, and wool really is a fantastic product for that. So there's a lot of interest there, but that comes with a caveat. I said, what about these carbon emissions? What's that going to do for us? But we can come back to that at a later date. Another new product that we've, we've partnered with is our friend um, Tim Brown from Allbirds. I don't know if anyone's noticed my lovely blue shoes on the stage. Who's heard of all birds here? Okay, who's got a pair? Fantastic, good to see the converts in a pair on here. Two pairs out here. Uh, all birds, an overnight success, seven years in the making. Um, we'd been partnering with, with Tim for a period of time and he'd struggled, frankly. He had this idea of wanting to make a unbranded, comfortable shoe. Uh, and he'd been working with a variety of different research in institutes to try and create a fabric, um, but couldn't quite get there. We ran into to Tim and introduced him to a partner of ours in Italy called Raider, and they managed to turn around a fabric, which has became this fabric, in three months. And then he launched a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, in 24 hours, he raised $250,000, so he quickly cancelled that Kickstarter campaign uh, in a panic and thought, geez, I've got to get this sorted out. And uh, from there, started to grow, build a product. Uh, the first challenge they had was the cost of the raw material. The merino was bloody expensive. So they couldn't go the traditional route of selling shoes. So what they decided, well, with the rise of the internet, the internet of things and retail uh, shifting more to online, they'd have to go direct to consumers, which was unheard of in shoes. Everyone thought to buy a pair of shoes, you've got to go to a shoe store. No one's going to buy a pair of shoes online. Well, when we practice the approach of design thinking and identifying what are the challenges or the drawbacks, the biggest concern people have about buying shoes online is, well, what happens if they don't fit? Or I don't like the colour. Can I send them back? Let's send a short note that says, as soon as you buy these, no questions asked, away go your shoes. You can send them back, no problem. And that solved a lot of the biggest problems. Of course, it helped that Time magazine introduced the wool shoes as the world's most comfortable shoe. That had quite an impact. Um, and over a short period of time, they grew significantly, significantly. So using a different model and approaching it with a natural fiber, they went from $17 million in the first year to around $200 million last year. Uh, they've just done another capital raise. It used to be all online. Now they've got about six stores around the, around the world. They've just launched into China. Um, and they've launched a new range of, of products because we can't, frankly, keep up with the wool supply uh, for their shoes. So they've launched, launched a range of um, what they call their tree toppers made out of a, a tree material and a natural rubber jandal, or if you're Australian, the thong, and uh, are going from strength to strength. But they view themselves as a natural materials company. And I've just got a, a quick uh, comment here from Tim. Wool is having a moment. There is just this enormous potential for the industry and there's some challenges no doubt but the sort of work that New Zealand Merino is doing and uh, I, I think in the fashion industry as a whole there is just an enormous potential for the fibre and I think finally 
you know, the, the, the industry's found a bit of a voice, they found a way of telling their story, and I just, I'm hugely excited about it and incredibly proud that the best wool in the world is coming from New Zealand and incredibly proud about, about what New Zealand Merino and, and the growers are doing. So very excited to be on the, on, on the, on the front edge of what I think is a, you know, is a great time to be in, be in the business that you're in. So with the, I guess what I'm trying to show here is that we've always had to fight for everything and we've had to think differently about everything that we've done through our new products, our new partners. And four years ago, we decided to get into Strongwool. And for us, uh, we have to balance out, when we look at innovation, uh, how we can make incremental change and get volume and try and support as much of you as possible through different segments, the 70%. How can we evolve and try and do things a little bit differently? And with 10% of our time, what can be truly revolutionary? What could be really disruptive and be a catalyst for really shifting the strong wall market? So with that mindset, we focus on two areas, what we call the red ocean. Uh, that's where it's bloody, the sharks live. It's really combative. It's a traditional uh, way of, uh, uh, or markets for strong wool in the blue ocean, which was quite ironic in hindsight. New ways and, new, and uses of using wool. We target, broke down our targets into industrial apparel, automotive and uh, indoor textiles. And again, we put the consumer at the core of everything we do. We don't profess to know everything. But what we do is try and surround ourselves with really smart people. So we do work with Stanford uh, University in the US, um, Fast Company magazine, uh, IDEO, which is one of the most innovative companies in the world. Fast Company called them uh, one of the 25 most innovative companies in the US. The other 24 all work with IDEO and Institute for the Future. So the first thing we did was go out and do some research in one of the traditional carpet markets in the US where a lot of strong wool still goes, uh, to learn about people and the experiences they have. Um, we did a lot, of, a lot of inside work in the USA and key markets in San Francisco, New York, um, and up through Seattle to try and learn as much as we could. And we found this global trend for, for wool, uh, for wellness, health and vitality is really vibrant through some of those traditional spaces. We've identified that it's gonna work in, in the emotion, emotional environment. Wool can really improve how we, uh, can create uh, a better us, really. It improves sleep and it improves uh, your quality of life. Um, where it focuses on the intimate environment next to skin, uh, how we can uh, improve the, the, the products that you wear, uh, how it can work in the built environment, whether it's flooring or insulation, and in the natural environment as well through its biodiversity. But what we also found was flooring follows fashion. It's just a little bit delayed. So what we found was um, this huge momentum that we're building in momentum, uh, sorry, in Merino, that's not translating through to flooring just yet. And we, when we spent time with our, our partners, they said, we see this success that's happening with Merino. We really want to learn how we can translate that to strong wall. So we thought, where's the most competitive yet collaborative place in the world where we can try and learn some ideas from each other? And that's Palo Alto. Stanford University, the home of Amazon, Google, YouTube, uh, Uber, all of these uh, innovative and disruptive tech companies. What's the thinking that happens there that can drive change for us? So we thought, let's take our strong wall partners and our fine wall partners there and learn how they can inter intersect uh, and understand each other. So we, we invited a group of companies and it's always tough going to companies like VF Corp, which is one of the largest brand houses in the world, uh, Tesla, Ikea, um, Best Wall Carpets from the US, sort of a group, one of the largest spinners in the world, and say, come, come to Stanford. Come here and let's learn from, learn from each other. Let's create this collision of ideas where we can see what's worked in fine wool and transfer that across the strong wall. Yeah.
So it was quite a punt. Uh, thankfully, they agreed. Uh, they came along. We had a fantastic week. Uh, and one of the outtakes was from the the Strongwall guys is that, well, yeah, it was a fantastic week. That's the alumni we created. Um, one of the, the outtakes was uh, we're a long way behind. We need to actually start building stories of provenance. We need to start building emotional connections with our customers. And what we know in flooring is that from our research, but also from speaking uh, to the manufacturers who are there and who are our partners now, that so often carpet is not just a grudge purchase, but it's a product that um, people don't have any vested emotional story in. It's characterized by all of those things we talked about earlier, combative relationships where people don't work together, um, where everyone's fighting, where it's bloody, it's red ocean. It's just hard, hard work. So we're, what we're doing is working with these guys and they said, we really need to shift the dial on what we're doing. And they asked that uh, we at New Zealand Merino brought together these companies and it was quite cool. We've got six different flooring companies from around the world. We've got the two largest carpet spinners in the world in the same room for the first time was, was a great one. And they've asked us to build a digital movement to try and create a real shift uh, for wool and strong wool and really honing in on the digital sphere because we know that's where we can create a, a movement. We can identify target uh, people and categories and groups who are really repurposed, uh, really focused on uh, natural, building the world and creating a better place. One of our attendees at that event was uh, a bloke called Mark Price. And Mark Price is the CEO of Firewire Surfboards. I told you I'd get there in the end. Firewire Surfboards are one of the most innovative companies in the world. They're owned by, uh, half owned by a guy called Kelly Slater. Has anyone heard of Kelly Slater? Yep. 11 times world champ. Devout eco warrior, 46 years old, still going strong on the, on the circuit. It's his last year. He's only said that for the last five years. Uh, Kelly's really motivated by it trying to make a change for the better, trying to do something better for the world. And the surfboard industry has been pretty much the same in terms of manufacturer for 50 years. Uh, so when we, we stopped in and, and met Mark, the CEO on the corner, it's the first, the initial meeting we had, uh, <laughs> we went across to the Pro Tour in, Queen, in Queensland on Surfers Paradise. So. And uh, it's the first meeting I've had with a CEO who's come in in board shorts and, and bare feet. But anyway, the first thing they tried to do was pick up these wool surfboards we delivered and break them, stand on them pretty much upside down. And they didn't break, thank goodness. And uh, Paul Barron, uh, the inventor of the technology, and I sort of breathed a sigh of relief and thought, well, that's, uh, that's interesting. They seem keen. They called us back 20 minutes down the road and said, can you guys come back? We can't believe it's really wool. So he took it back to them um, and sat down and talked about it. And one of the things Mark said to me is, we love the story about wool. 
we know that it's the sustainability aspect is off the charts. He thinks that the surfboard industry is, is contaminated so many landfills and products around the world that it really has to make a change and this product can help him as a company to do it. Now, the thing that really blew them away is that this is light, it's flexible, which apparently is really good for surfing, uh, light and flexible and it, it really helps with the story. So we, uh, we got into it with them and we've had a whole bunch of trial and errors. Uh, there's been multiple trips for us over to the US and where they manufacture in Thailand. Um, but it's coming out uh, this month. They've been selling it uh, around the world, selling it in to the retailers and the, the feedback has been really positive. Um, and uh, we're really excited about what it's gonna do. But one of the caveats Mark said at the start is we have to build a connection with the growers because we can't be exposed to the risk that we've seen these other fashion brands have. So they came out to New Zealand and spent time for time with us. And I think this is supposed to be another little video. Uh, and said, we have to understand, we have to see the source of our fiber. The wool surfboard is comparable to a traditional surfboard in terms of its performance. The connection back to the farms is really important for us to see the passion with which the farmers run their organizations, the way the sheep live basically and the way in which they are cared for was a very moving experience and it gave us a connection back to the supply chain that is often lost with the other raw materials that we use. So we're looking constantly at ways in which we can improve the experience our animals have across our farms in every dimension and that's our palming promise to our customers. Are we really enthusiastic about what strong wool can do in composites and we think surfboards are the tip of the iceberg, there's so many more opportunities so we're really excited. Not only is it a New Zealand made product, it's an amazing fibre and that it um, performs just as good, if not better than fibreglass. So this is the model they've uh, released it in and the Seaside was launched late last year. Um, it was the fastest, biggest selling surfboard in the world last year. It's under the name of a guy called Rob Machado, uh, who's another eco-warrior. Uh, they've released it in, in one model so far uh, and they're expecting a, an extension um, into some of the other designers that they use but for us uh, as I noted in there for us it's the tip of the iceberg um, you know they make 29 roughly 29 million square meters of fiberglass a year so if we only get a very small portion of that market say one percent of it there's a huge uh, volume of wool that could progress down that track and we've been quite excited about the interest that we've received. Um, I'm under a few non-disclosure agreements, so I can't say too much about it, but it covers a, a couple of different areas which will be um, quite exciting and quite innovative. Um, but of course, we have to be we're very conservative about that sort of stuff, but it's, it's looking quite quite exciting. The problem is it costs a lot, of, a lot and development takes time. So it, it is, we're at the start of a journey. Uh, we're really excited about the potential and the possibility. Uh, the technology is only just scraping the surface at the moment, um, but we're really looking forward to the future. There's a number of other products we're working on um, with, with companies that we also can't say too much about, I'm sorry, but basically involves how can we transform strong wool into a material that can fit into um, different markets and whether it's breaking it down into its constituent protein properties into keratin or it's even finer state and then reconstituting it with different fibers. Um, that's what we're exploring with a couple of companies around the world. So for us, uh, our next step has been with these innovations, how can we, uh, and changes and disruptions and challenges we've faced over the years as an organization, how can we as a company shift what we do from just being a, a, a wool company that's got really leans into um, creativity and innovation and um, sustainability and start to transform people away from oil to a world future. Well, we've just moved into a new, uh, a new premises in Christchurch. Um, it's called Studio ZQ. So we started off with an ethical brand, which was ZQ, but our mindset we've found through speaking with people around the world is one that um, encourages people to explore these new technologies or new ideas or new concepts. So we've got a, a base in the office where we all hang out, but also this Studios EQ, which is going to be an innovation hub. 
for new business, new development, it's a chance for us to really try and get in behind new concepts and boost them up around natural fibres. So that's been really exciting for us. We've got a couple of people we're partnering with. There's a young guy who's made uh, transformed Didymo into plastic, who we're doing a couple of things with. But at our core, what we really want to do is bring, bring the best brands in the world back to you, back to our growers to install pride. And I'm just going to finish off with one last video, I promise, of a, a partner of ours from Denmark, a Danish shoe company called Glareups, who make not like all birds, the indoor, indoor version, which are very soft and comfortable. This is Moringa Station, and uh, yeah, I've been here for 11 years. You can see by the, um, the scenery around here, beautiful uh, property to be working on. It's been really great to find out about Glare Up. It's been fantastic to know where our wool goes. After years of sharing it and sorting it and sending it out the front gate, it's actually nice to know that there is a product at the end of it and it's such, it is an awesome product. We've just uh, loaded the, the wool on the truck and that's the last feedback pretty much we've received apart from finding out what it, what it received at auction. So to be supplying into this Glare Ups contract is very re rewarding. Um, I've never seen the, the end product or, or even known where, where my wool's ended up. So yeah, very satisfying. This came from our farm and we have this fantastic partnership. I'm uh, just one small part of a, a team who've been tapped on the shoulder to come up here. So I just want to quickly introduce you to three quarters of the team at our, our new studio. They all say hi. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. We'd love to work with you in the future. Um, I'm extremely passionate about Strongwall because uh, I'm passionate about New Zealand uh, and the difference that we believe we can make in the world through a, 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 fantastic, a fantastic fiber. So thanks for listening to me. I'm looking forward to meeting the rest of you through the day. Cheers. Yes, yes, yes. Hey. Who's going to be first? So, um, yeah, well, there's a couple of questions. So we've got, well, um, well we might just start at the top of it. Uh, we use crossbred wool for these surfboards. Um, I don't want to get, yeah. We've priced it up at $8.50 a kilo to go into this material, and it still competes with fiberglass. So that's why we're quite excited about doing something with this material in the future. I'm not sure what you're getting for your crossbreed wool at the moment, but it's probably not too much. <laughs> so yes, uh, the first person up here to touch a surfboard gets a pair of wool boots. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you, mate. And you can pass it around if you like. Come and see me afterwards. It's one way to get some activity. Um, oh, that's the three questions, right, anything else? Just yell one out, I'm not used to this sort of technology. ZQ accredited. Um, I've got some business cards here, so just I'll catch up with anyone who's interested afterwards. Um, our ZQ system is third party accredited. Like we love to say how great we are, as you've probably heard, but we've got to make sure we've got the integrity behind that. So Assure Quality runs our audits. They come around on farm. We do one audit every three years, um, and it's pretty straightforward. Would it pass track if you also got combined with the gap? Yeah, we've we've looked at a few ways we can combine with other audits out there because we know that no one wants to be getting ten audits coming through the gate each month. So, absolutely, investigating that. Right. Hadley, we've got a couple more questions. Try and keep up. Um, Where do you want to start? So we'll, we know about the success of Fine World becoming connected to the end user. How do we do that for strong wool? What's preventing this from happening? Um, so that's, that's a really interesting question. Uh, one of the real challenges uh, we have with strong wool uh, is uh, the wiring. 
of how we sell it. We've got a really established model on strong wool. When we kicked off on fine wool, we actually controlled the majority of the fibre that we transacted. So it gave us the ability to A, tell stories, but also to control the price um, more. We were, there's less uh, undercutting of us by other people in the marketplace. So one of the challenges from us um, is being able to transact more wool. So yes, we'd love to have more growers come and join us. We aren't the cheapest wool company around there to sell your wool, but that investment allows us to build the relationships we do, the connections that we do. We do a lot of work to get our premiums. Um, we tell stories, or we build sustainability programs, we do life cycle assessments, we build um, environmental product declarations, pretty much anything that we can do, we do to get, get value. But sometimes that is undermined by people coming in and selling stuff at the in uh, a commodity market. So anyone who wants to get on board, love to have you. That'll help us. How does strong will need to be, how fine does strong will need to be to meet your contracts for all birds? Very fine. <laughs> Between 17 and 19 micron for all birds. <laughs> uh, what's next after the surfboard? I can't say too much, but you saw some pictures. <laughs> Boats, automotive, because that's going to give us some volume. Um, but also there's going to be some small, fast winds around windsurfs, windsurfers, snowboards and uh, skateboards. Cool. Is there a move to transfer the barcode concept into Strongwall? Uh, the eth what we found in Strongwall is that with the companies we work with, it's been less about um, the ethics of the, of the fibre, of the practices on farm. It's been more about the marketing support and creative support that we can provide. So I showed you a brief picture of some of our team. We've got about 50 people uh, in the office in, around New Zealand and um, Six to eight of those are creative. Basically, it's a marketing and creative agency that delivers work for us. So we're trying to help our strong wall guys build stories, um, build sales programs, build marketing campaigns, or guide them into the ability to do that. So that's what we're really trying to do. How soon can better value be achieved for strong wall? We've got some nice contracts at the moment, but not enough of them. Um, of course, the contracts we've got uh, currently We'll focus on white wool, low VM, and we're having a, a bit of a challenge with colour at the moment with rain, so <laughs> that doesn't end. But that's why we need more growers so we can fill up the contracts. What about will New Zealand have a wool composite boat in the America's Cup? Oh, no. <laughs> so maybe in the next cycle, if we win. No, we haven't talked to Team New Zealand yet because <laughs> we've got a long way to go before we can build an America's Cup boat yet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, are we the farmers best to engage the revolution to help you make a success, a success? Yes. Look for something different. You have. We, I mean, the status quo hasn't worked. We need to look for new opportunities. And I'll be frank, this was one of the reasons I came to this company uh, five years ago, four years ago, was because they were doing something different. They have got a model that can deliver value to growers. And that's the only way it works. If we can deliver you value, then then we can keep going, we can keep growing, we can pass it on, that's the model. How has New Zealand been financially benefited from the investment in all birds? We haven't, we don't have a financial investment in all birds, we supply all their wool with forward contracts and that uh, goes back to our growers, so value. Um, another anecdote from Tim Brown uh, at Stanford, he met us and said, yeah, I love our wool, I love New Zealand, it's really important to me, but make sure you stay the best, because if you're not the best, our customers expect us to only deal with the best, so you have to constantly seek to, and strive to, to improve. Not much. Sorry, how much greasy wool goes into a surfboard? Not much. That's why it's the tip of the, the spear. It's a proof of concept with um, some really high-profile high brands. Um, that's going to get a lot of attention, and that attention is what's going to get us some new products. One interesting company I, I uh, heard of was uh, based in Colorado who build... Uh, Wind uh, energy developing propellers, basically. Wind turbines, that would use a lot of wool. But we've got a bit of work to do there. Yes. Uh, any negative feedback to you or do you expect any from Peter Reese wool surfboards? Uh, is there any chance they will get on board with the sustainability surf story? We actually won an award from Peter in the, in the very early days when we banned mulesing. And no, we still didn't go and talk to them then. I mean, they are... Uh, I'm going to 
a room full of people. <laughs> tell, tell me what you really think. <laughs> I, I don't think they see reason, to be frank. I think they're looking for any angle they can to create a, a story and a controversy, and the end game doesn't make any sense with me. So, um, yeah, we don't think we're, we're definitely not going to win any awards from Peter. What's the recommended retail price of surfboards? It's going to be around eleven hundred dollars in New Zealand. It's a high performance surfboard. They they focus on providing boards to the pros. Um, Dubai hot oil wool New Zealand pavilion is that an intersection or a collision? A collision? Absolutely. That's where new ideas are created. But what we find is the whole focus of that conference is sustainability. So we know oil is not sustainable. So it's going to be an interesting. Um, I, I, I think we might just about wrap that up. There's okay. some awesome <laughs> questions. Um, Hadley, just um, yeah, awesome presentation. Um, awesome to see some um, hope for some positive news for strong wool farmers um, for the future. But um, just on behalf of everyone here, we've just got our small um, gift. So thank you very much. Thank you.